This episode is brought to you by the dating app Bumble. You know what instantly makes someone more attractive? Kindness. Like when they take you out to your favorite restaurant just because, or when they check to make sure you made it home safely, or when they surprise you with tickets to that really obscure rock band you love. That kind of thoughtfulness is really, really hot. Kindness is sexy. Find it on Bumble. Vaginas are absolute magic, and Ali is here to give them the respect they deserve. That means shame free supplements made with clinically studied ingredients to keep your pH in check and your pleasure a priority. Put yourself on top. Go to Ollie.com today. These statements have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. This product is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. What is up, you potty training warriors? Okay, today let's talk about potty training multiples. Stop praising things that don't deserve praise and public restrooms. All very hot topics. <laughs> so let's hit potty training multiples. The concept of potty training multiples is actually very easy. It's no different than how I lay out in the book. You just need a pair of hands per butt, particularly, I would say, for the first day to three days. So, however, you can arrange that. And I know everybody's circumstance is different, but you know, if you have any caregivers on board, any parents, grandparents, spouse, mother's helper, sometimes a lot of parents just don't really have a huge, you know, family village or just moved, but you can find a mother's helper a lot of times, which is, you know, sometimes a younger kid who can help and just have another pair of hands. So that's one thing. And you can attempt it by yourself, this happens a lot to me. I'll get people who present me with an impossible situation and I can't change your situation. So if you literally can't find anybody to have another pair of hands on deck, it's just going to be hard. Like I can't change that. And I, there's not really a huge plan for that. Right. So do your best to get another hands per butt. And even if it is like just one day, because that one day you got to really keep an eye on them, right. That first day. But also with twins or triplets and even beyond is, I mean, if you have quadruplets or more, I think, you know, you need another pair of hands. <laughs> but what happens is, you know, one will start to pee and the other one has to. So on that note, another thing with multiples is buy the same potty chair. Do not buy different colors. Do not buy different potty chairs. Just buy the same potty chair. You know, have two, have four. I like potty chairs all over the house for the first couple of days. You can get them in secondhand shops or yard sales. They don't have to be brand new. But, you know, your kid only has a couple of seconds when they're first learning this skill from when they have the sensation to pee and they actually go pee. So eliminate all fights, eliminate any issues just by buying the same color, the same style, the same type of potty chair, and that will super duper help. Another really cool thing about, well, cool, interesting, I guess, about multiples, mostly we're dealing with twins because that's more common, right? But what happens is there's always one twin that is like a little quote unquote, ahead, right? Like maybe more extroverted, more physically skilled, maybe has a jump on language. And then there's a twin who sort of hangs back. And, and of course I'm generalizing, but that has been pretty consistent with what I found in my work is there's always a one that you think is gregarious is probably going to get it. And most parents start to potty train twins. They're like, yep, twin A is totally going to get it. Twin B, I'm not sure. Right. Cause there's that the twin who sort of hangs behind. I have found almost, almost a hundred percent that it is the twin you think isn't going to get it is the one who picks it up. And I think what happens is I think our demeanor changes. I think we tend to be, when we think a kid isn't necessarily going to get it, we tend to not invest maybe as much. Whereas we think, oh, I'll just kind of put my energy into the kid who I think is going to get it. And the other kid just has no pressure. And they're like, all right, fine. I don't know why that's just a supposition, but, but I find it very consistent. So don't judge that. So let's say you're a day, two days into potty training. And typically what I see in real life potty training is you maybe don't have that second set of hands, right? You've somehow gotten your spouse or your mother-in-law, your, your mother, mother's helper. You've managed to secure another hands per butt, another set of hands per butt for a couple of days, but then you're flying solo, say on day three, and you've got two kids pee and poop everywhere. And you're like, what the hell is going on? (laughs) So 
if both twins see, and I'm, I'm addressing twins, but this goes for other multiples. I just see twins more often than any other sort of set of multiples. If one twin looks like they're super getting it and the other twin is like not, it is okay to re-diaper the twin who's not. It is better to go with the kid who's getting it and sign, seal, deliver that child. And I see this happen a lot. Re-diaper the other child because you just can't. It's too insanity making to try to chase two kids around, one who's getting it and one who's not. And we don't want the kid who's getting it to slump back and take steps backwards. We want to build on that success. And then you can hit the other twin who once twin A is like secure, signed, sealed, delivered potty training, twin B is more likely to be like, oh, okay, that's not going to kill me. This is fine. So I want to give you permission to do that. Now, if it looks like both kids are doing really well, do your best to continue. Absolutely. But it does happen that one twin just excels, the other one doesn't, and a parent is by themselves and they're very frustrated and they just don't have the capacity to handle two kids who don't quite have it yet. So that's it for multiples. Really, the process is no different. The way you would go about it, just like the book, the blocks of learning, everything like that. Next up, let's talk about this because this is happening more and more. One of the beautiful things about my work is I get to see parenting trends and I've been doing this long enough. It's 13 years now full time that, man, you see things come and go. You hear buzzwords, buzz phrases, then all of a sudden they're gone. You see trends and they're gone. And we have a trend right now. Well, maybe we'll even dig into this a little better as I'm talking this out loud. We have this trend now of praising children over praising and praising things that aren't worth praising. So if your child is sitting, and and this could be for a kid who's like super anxiety ridden, right? With the potty training and just getting them to sit is a progress. It's great to acknowledge it's a progress, but don't give your kid a whole bunch of praise for sitting when they're not producing or they're withholding. Like, so what I see happening in my work right now is, oh my gosh, you sat down. You're such a big girl. Yeah, but you're giving her praise for doing the bare minimum. And it's a bad parenting trend. It goes along with like, if you could just take good job out of your vocabulary in general, I talk about this a lot on my parenting podcast, which is like, good job, good job, good job. It's not a good job. Don't tell them they're doing a good job, especially when they go, mom, 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 watch me. And then they like blink and hop on one foot and parents go, oh, good job, dude. You could do that in your sleep. That's not a good job. Show me something impressive. (laughs) You don't have to praise your child for every action, particularly if the action is not the one you want, or it's not a completed action. So sitting on the potty is great. You could be like, nice sitting. You can literally reflect. I see you sitting but you don't have to praise it because then the kid's getting praise when they're not completing the task. And toddlers don't have a lot of nuance in emotion, you guys. I just, sorry to keep talking about the parenting podcast, but I just did a podcast about toddlers thinking emojis. It's like this this really like black or white thinking. So if you're praising sitting down, they're like, all right, good, I'm, I'm good. I did the thing, I sat, right? So we have to really show them what we're asking for them. So if you're too neutral, or if you're too exuberant in praise for something that is not worth praise, then your child's going to get that confused. And they're going to be like, okay, cool. I'm, I'm a superstar. Look at me. I sat on the potty, but I didn't do anything. So we really, really, really want to watch that. I say toddlers think in emojis. It's just like, I love the like sideways laughing, crying emoji that I overuse that entirely. <laughs> but there's that. And like this red beat angry emoji. Think of those as the spectrum of your child's feelings. So they don't have a lot of nuance. And so we really, with our tone, with our facial expressions, with our looks, with our nonverbal communication, we kind of have to guide them as to where we want their emotions to go, which isn't controlling. We're not trying to manipulate or control them. But if we're saying good job at something that's not really a good job, we have just lowered the bar by a lot. And that brings us into like positive and negative reinforcements. I didn't plan on talking about this today, but it's just such a natural segue that I'm going to, which is rewards and punishments. And so I don't, if you, you know, hopefully you've read my book, I am not a fan of rewards for potty training. I think it's socialized behavior. I think it's expected behavior. I also don't think you should pay your child for grades, good grades, or for setting the table or anything that is expected socialized behavior. I also think that at this age to set up rewards for 
basic, again, socialized behavior is setting up entitlement. I know the rest of the globe body trains with M&Ms. I know a lot, not the globe, America. (laughs) I think, you know, a lot of people use rewards and what you don't ever hear about on social media is the power struggles. So I work with families that end up in family therapy because of rewards. Potty training not only doesn't happen, but potty training gets lost in the shuffle and the power struggles over the reward system become crazy. So I'm not a huge fan of them. I think they have a place and I think they're a tool, particularly if you're say a couple of weeks in and you can't really tell if your child has sort of a glitch in learning or if it's behavioral. And so sometimes I'll enact a reward for a day or two, because if your kid can pee and poop on the potty for an M&M, they can do it. And so it just gives you a baseline of like, all right, stinker, I know you can do this now because we don't want to come down hard on behavior if your child has a glitch in learning, right? Number one, we fix all the glitches in learning, all the potential physical things that could be going wrong with potty training before we attend behavior. I don't ever assume it's bad behavior on a child's part. And that comes up with like withholding poop. A lot of parents think it's bad behavior and it's not. It's a physical problem. This episode is brought to you by the dating app Bumble. You know what instantly makes someone more attractive? Kindness. Like when they take you out to your favorite restaurant just because, or when they check to make sure you made it home safely, or when they surprise you with tickets to that really obscure rock band you love. That kind of thoughtfulness is really, really hot. Kindness is sexy. Find it on Bumble. So with rewards, though, like, again, it has a time and a place, but I use it and I get in and out very, very quickly. I don't care if you use rewards, but let me tell you something. The amount of people who contact me and say, oh, yeah, we use rewards and it's working about like 40 percent of the time. Rewards working 40% of the time is similar to being kind of pregnant. It's not working, you guys. If it's working 40% of the time, it's not working. Ditch it. Your child's learning how to manipulate you for the M&M, the mini marshmallow, the dollar store prize. That's ridiculous. I have to say that. A treasure chest with dollar store prizes for your kid to pee and poop on the potty is ridiculous. And again, it's going to lead to entitlement. You know, when your child first uh, slept through the night, you didn't like, hey, do you want a prize? There's just certain things that we do as humans and all humans put their excrement in a designated place. So I would stay away from that. And that comes into, you know, people will come at me and say, you know, well, positive reinforcement. Listen, positive reinforcement It was probably a trend in like the early 70s, and then it really, really morphed into being in the 80s. So I'm 54 for reference. And what happened when I was growing up is like, say you got like all A's and like one C. Nobody gave a rat's ass about the A's. You got reamed for the C. You didn't get any acknowledgement for the positive. You only got reamed for the negative. That kind of sucks because you're like, I worked really hard for those A's, but nobody cared. It was the C that got you in trouble. So, you know, psychologists parenting people, everybody was like, well, wait a minute, maybe this isn't the best approach. So then we decided that positive reinforcement is better. So you might, you know, say, hey, wow, these A's are amazing, but there is this C. How about we look at that and see what's going on with that C? Because I know you're capable. Gosh, you got all A's in all these other subjects. So something's clearly going on with math, Jamie. (laughs) I speak from personal experience. So that's positive reinforcement. Now, if you have special needs or neurodivergent kids, we might be talking about a more concrete thinking where we might need to employ some rewards in that system. Like I have found that working with kids on the autistic spectrum, there's less manipulation with rewards and it's just more black or white for those kids. So there is that component. But for your average neurotypical kid, you don't want to start down the path of rewards. Now you can give positive reinforcement. And again, that goes back to like, hey, I saw you sat down on the potty. Excellent. But don't overpraise that. Don't give them kudos. Don't give them a prize for sitting. But do you know what I'm saying? When they didn't complete the task. So we do want to focus on the positive. But somehow in our society, as this always happens, we pull the parenting pendulum in this one direction. And now kids are getting prizes for everything. They're getting rewards for accepted behavior. You know, siblings are getting gifts on the birthday party for their sister. It's just, it's too much, you guys. And we know that entitlement is rampant. And I know that it's one of those things that you might not even be thinking about with a toddler, but I can tell you, I've been doing this long enough that it leads to entitled kids who think they deserve prizes for breathing. So we just don't want to do that, but you can always focus on the positive and address the negative. We just don't have to harp on the negative as much as it is. 
All right, let's hit public restrooms since that's also a huge issue. So public restrooms, particularly now, so I am recording this in July of 2022. So assuming this podcast will live on and on and on for thousands of years (laughs) and giving a frame of reference of coming out of the pandemic. Our toddlers now were pandemic babies. They are most definitely pandemic toddlers, and they're having bigger struggles than we've seen in past generations, which of course makes perfect sense. And I hesitate to even use words like behind or even compare them. There's no comparison. We had a global pandemic. It was scary as fuck. And now we have to give these kids grace and patience. And one of the areas is public restrooms. Now, public restrooms have always been a tricky transition for kids, but it's really tricky now. And two things are making it more difficult. One is that these kids didn't have public restroom experiences when they were babies. So even in a baby carrier stroller, public restrooms might be brand new to your kid, right? But the other thing is because of COVID, we've slipped over, and I'm not faulting anybody, but we've slipped over into almost psychotic germaphobe. Now, public restrooms would make any mom freak out before COVID, but now like people are bathing their kids in hand sanitizer. So those two things are contributing to it. So public restrooms are a challenge. Let's just kind of take the baseline, not even the pandemic aspect of it. Listen, public restrooms usually are big. They're live, which means they're like porcelain, right? There's tile, there's metal. And so sound bounces off. So sometimes it's just sensory overload in the best of circumstances. Our pandemic toddlers, remember they were born in like form, their nervous system was formed mostly under lockdown. So these kids have like, I don't think it's diagnosable like sensory issues, but they are way more sensory sensitive than kids I've seen before the pandemic. And public restrooms are going to make them fly through the roof. It's just a lot of noise. And I'll be a son of a gun. Most of those Dyson hand dryers, check them out. Like when you go into a bathroom, a public restroom, it's like right when you turn the corner, you walk in and there's a Dyson hand dryer that's slightly higher than your three-year-old and somebody's using it. And those things are loud. So I've seen kids like leave their body in the restroom because it's like so much The other thing that makes public restrooms tricky is automatic flushers. We'll talk about that because the kids aren't rated properly. So it's like getting a bidet, which can be very disconcerting to a little one. And the third thing that makes public restrooms tricky is your demeanor and your level of germaphobe or not, or just concern. And so parents tend to freak out, which is like, don't touch that. You know, we get very on edge, which of course makes the child feel unsafe and wonky themselves. So when it comes to the noise, just throw in your bag because, you know, if your kid's new at potty training, you're still probably carrying some extra clothes or snacks or something, right? So make sure you throw in some, if you have concert headphones or even earmuffs or just anything that you can cover your child's ears and prepare them and say, you know what, sometimes these bathrooms are very loud. So we're going to want to cover your ears so you don't get nervous. The next thing is automatic flushers have post-its in that bag because you want to put a post-it over the automatic flusher. If you don't have post-its, you can actually wet a paper towel or some toilet paper and cover the automatic sensor. Just take it off when you're done because that's gross. And that will really help. For little boys, you can always do the red solo cup trick. You can always have a, a cup in your purse or a mason jar or something so they don't actually have to, you know, sit. Little girls, actually, if you take off their panties, they can sometimes stand and squat on the the toilet itself if that helps. And then for your demeanor, you just admit you can wash your hands, guys. You know, it's far better, I think, to have a chill attitude and wash hands I don't know anybody who's gotten truly sick from a restroom and kids touch everything and they are disgusting, but the better off you can be chill about it, the better off your child's going to be. So just know, wash your hands carefully, you know, maybe, I don't know, even bring a face cloth or something so you can really scrub things down by things. I mean, your child, (laughs) but it's going to be like your attitude that rules the way that goes. Now, I do think I mentioned this in the book, and it is worth addressing, especially now in the middle of summer, because if your child has to go to preschool, they may not be acquainted with any sort of public restrooms yet. So it is, it's something you can practice. And I think this is something in potty training and parenting that people forget is that you can practice these things. Early on in my career here, I had a a couple that potty trained and the dad took it on like it was a Navy SEAL assignment. And it was hilarious. And they were like a weekend and over the weekend, he just took the little one out, 
pack snacks and they like literally just made a tour of every public restroom and the kid did great. So there's that option. Another option is to really start introducing your kid with like single stall family rooms. So maybe that's at the library or even like Target. I know my Target has one. I don't know if yours does, but find the places with those single stalls because those are going to be less live, less people, less fear, less noise, and then kind of progress. So, or, you know, if your kid's really struggling, try other people's houses and even tell a friend like, hey, can we just stop by and try to use your bathroom? Because we're just struggling with finding new places. So one of the things I'm a big proponent of in parenting as general is with your people, with your friends, being really honest when your kid is struggling. And I think this is where we have messed up the like, quote unquote, village is we all try to present as though we're perfect parents. You know, I'm sure you have at least a couple of friends locally that you could say, listen, we're potty training. She's doing great at home, but we're having trouble with public restrooms. Can we just come by and use your bathroom just so she starts to learn other places? Some people might think that's weird, but I think that's how we get our villages back. And I think that's how we stop perfectionistic parenting and holding our bar so high that we can't ever reach it. All right, you guys, that's all I have for today. As always, rock on. I appreciate you. And if you are so inclined, leave a review because that helps me. Don't forget, we have courses in everything. Daycare course, night training course, poop withholding course, video book. If you haven't read my book and you don't like to read, go to my website. You can get the lit video book, which is awesome. It's an hour and it's a, they've distilled my book down into a really engaging video. So that's available as well. All right. Cheers, guys. Cheers.